Good evening. I'm Desiree Battaglia, Media Relations Specialist at Northwestern Medicine. Tonight, we're coming to you live from the Living Well Cancer Resource Center in Geneva. We're actually in the kitchen at Living Well. And I am joined tonight by two of the Living Well and Northwestern Medicine dietitians. So this is Nancy Zawicki and Mary Zupke. And they are going to be answering some of the most common questions we receive from patients who are working through a cancer diagnosis. So with that, I will let them take it away. Hi, um, I'm Nancy Zawicki. I'm a registered dietitian with Northwestern Medicine. And Mary and I both work together at the Delnor Cancer Center. And we do nutrition and cooking classes here at Living Well, which we really love doing. So we're happy that you can join us today. And um, we're just going to answer questions that you might have um, interest in. So first question just came in. And it's, I struggle getting enough protein. Are there certain sources of protein that you recommend? And this is from a cancer, a breast cancer perspective, um, the person who requested it. So with protein, we want to include a variety. We support the Mediterranean diet lifestyle, which is um, evidence-based through the American Cancer Society. And you can see behind me this wonderful array of vegetables and fruit. And so we promote people to eat for color, um, but the protein sources can come from lean poultry, fish, um, beans, legumes, eggs. Um, even if you want some red meat, um, people with breast cancer can have about two servings a week, like a small steak or other pork. Um, people with rectal and colon cancer should limit their red meat maybe three times a month um, or whatever your medical oncologist is suggesting as well. Um, but you try to have protein with each meal and even incorporate it as a snack. Um, peanut butter for a snack, yogurt, dairy product um, are all very good. And some people who might struggle with getting enough protein can also consider a commercial beverage like um, Premier Protein is good because it does not contain isolation soy protein, which a lot of breast cancer um, people who are estrogen positive have to avoid that ingredient. Right, and um, we have a couple examples of the soy protein isolate. It's found in a couple of processed foods, so like the stovetop stuffing, stuffing for example. <laughs> um, it has what it's called as hydrolyzed soy protein. So you want to just kind of look at the label in that ingredient listing area and just kind of look if it says soy protein or if it says soy, like isolated soy or hydrolyzed soy, that can really increase cancer recurrence or tumor growth. So we, for those ER positive breast cancer patients, we really want to avoid that. So, um, you know, if you're getting processed foods, which we don't re recommend a lot of those, but if you are, um, make sure you're looking at the label. Um, we also found it in like this Hormel chili. So something to just kind of keep in mind when you're shopping. And also um, isolated soy protein or soy protein concentrates can also be found in high protein bars, um, high protein beverages, frozen meatballs, um, you know, different like pot pies, canned soup. So anything that's processed, you want to look at the ingredient panel and check for that and avoid it. That's why we promote use of fresh foods, and that way you don't have a label and you can just put your meals together. Um, I wanted to mention also with the protein, something that you should try to avoid is like bacon, lunch meat, hot dogs. But on the other hand, we say that, but if you went to a ball game and you wanted a hot dog, once in a while is okay. But as a daily, weekly basis, we don't want you having a lot of those processed meats. Um, and, and when you're purchasing something like that, if you are having it on occasion, then look for the nitrate free, because that'll be really Yeah, helpful. that's good. Yeah. Great. Well, we put in the comment section here that if you have a question for Nancy or Mary, feel free to share it in the comments section. We are reviewing those and we will get to as many as we can this evening. Um, again, we are going over some of the most commonly asked questions for patients that are working through a cancer diagnosis. So feel free to share those with us. Uh, we did have some questions messaged to us, so I will go through those. Um, one of them is about a plant-based diet. Now, what is a plant-based diet and is it considered the same as a Mediterranean? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. A lot of times people think plant-based means 
only plants, but a Mediterranean diet or the Mediterranean lifestyle, as Nancy mentioned, is including those plant-based protein sources, um, more fruits and vegetables, more chicken and fish. So you can actually have some protein sources that um, complement the plant-based diet. So the chicken and fish and having the healthy fats like olive oil, peanut butter in moderation, also whole grains and low-fat dairy. So those are all part of the Mediterranean plant-based diet. So it's great to have more fruits and vegetables. That's one of the key things in eating from the rainbow. We wanted to kind of show the rainbow with our display <laughs> here. So we have a lot of those anti-inflammatory foods as well um, that are part of that plant-based diet. And that can decrease the risk of chronic illness in the future. So some of those foods are like broccoli, um, cauliflower. So we wanted to show some of those Brussels sprouts, uh, including those will help decrease risk of recurrence. And I wanted to mention uh, a, a recommended servings per day could be like five to seven or six to eight servings of vegetables and fruit. And like Mary said, include a variety. And those vegetables like the broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprout, are, they call them cruciferous vegetables. And they're very, they're on the anti-inflammatory list, so they're very good. But you know, I mentioned, I say Mediterranean diet slash lifestyle. And lifestyle has to do with, if you look at the pyramid at the bottom, there's little people like they're eating together so promoting family meal time sometimes you know meals can be more enjoyable when you're not just eating alone um, and staying active um, being part of a group part of your community and not to isolate yourself either whether it's even like with COVID and this weather picking up the phone or writing a letter to someone all that um, you're sharing yourself and it, it just helps the whole person too and getting good night's sleep as well too. well and we we like to talk about activity because activity is one of those key things in nutrition related to survivorship, which is any time after diagnosis. So the current U.S. Dietary Guidelines for Activity is 30 to 45 minutes a day, five days a week, a couple days a week strength training, a couple days a week stretching. So fitting that in, it doesn't have to be that amount when you start. It can be five minutes. It can be 10 minutes. So even just walking around your house right now, we're not going outside yeah. <laughs> um, as much. And so walking up and down the stairs, you know, anything that will start to increase your activity is helpful. And people who experience a cancer diagnosis and they start implementing these positive changes in their lifestyle end up leading a healthier lifestyle um, because every day they're trying to eat healthy, get their exercise, get a good night's sleep, making time for themselves where it takes their mind off of cancer, you know, whatever activity you enjoy doing where you kind of lose yourself in it or reading a book, all contribute to your health and your happiness. And you really want to protect up here is staying positive and just keeping that positive outlook. And it really helps the whole process. So, yeah, right. yeah. Great information. So we do have some comments rolling in during oh. our live. Um, I know that, Nancy, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but Carolyn joined and she asked, what feeds estrogen positive breast cancer? So with the estrogen positive, um, you want to avoid the isolated soy protein. That's really the important thing. And a person who has a breast cancer diagnosis moving forward wants to avoid weight gain. If they're where they're at, like their preferred weight, then that daily exercise helps them to manage their weight. And if they're needing, if they're wanting to lose a little weight when they're done with treatment, we don't really want them doing it during treatment, um, cutting back on some calories, but making sure that you're getting your fruits and vegetables and your, your meats and poultry and, and all that. It's starting off, if you're trying to do weight control, cut out the sugar um, and then those snack foods and things that you just open the pantry and grab, those are the things you want to get away from. But basically, it's um, just doing that healthy lifestyle that we talked about, avoiding isolated soy protein, and also limiting alcohol, too. That's something you would discuss with your medical oncologist, but many of them are saying um, possibly like two drinks a week or eight a month is recommended because alcohol, they're finding, can increase risk of recurrence. So um, it's a science, so things are always changing. But, um, yeah, the healthy lifestyle is what's really recommended. 
Great. And then we have one more question from Carol. Uh, is soy specifically bad for breast cancer? No, you can have soy, like tofu, ednami. That is okay. It's the isolated soy and the soy protein concentrates that you want to avoid. Yeah, and I think it's about two to three servings a day is okay to have. So um, adding those in is a great plant-based protein. Um, we have some, just a little plug, we have some great recipes online too. So if you're looking at the Living Well website, you can go to the culinary nutrition section and there are some classes, the cooking classes. We have a lot of good recipes on there so you can look for some of those. But tofu is a, a great idea to include in. I love that. And also, we're doing these classes through Living Well. Um, they're a nutrition topic, plus we do a cooking demo. And the reason why we do the cooking demo is to show how easy some of these recipes can be, but we're using fresh, whole foods when we do our recipe. We're getting away from the process. We use a lot of herbs, um, spices, um, garlic, onion, because things like shallots and onions and garlic, they're also on the, they're anti-inflammatory. So they're all good foods to use. And I can't really reach it, but well, here. <laughs> Turmeric is another spice uh, or herb, what is it, a spice? Yeah. yeah, that we want, you can use in cooking. <laughs> Um, and it doesn't really have a lot of taste, but it is anti-inflammatory. And then cinnamon as well is good. Um, but really, and, and this is fresh basil. So, yeah. Well, and we wanted to show that it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, this is just um, mozzarella, like a low-fat cheese, um, tomatoes, basil. This would be more in the summertime usually. But we wanted to show that it's easy to just put together a quick snack and still be part of the Mediterranean diet. It doesn't have to be complicated, but it can still be delicious. When we were cutting up the basil, we were smelling all that <laughs> yeah. aroma. And it kind of gets you're excited about eating. So don't forget about those fresh herbs in the winter. It'll help liven up your food. And sometimes people will drizzle a little balsamic vinegar on that. Mm -hmm. And that is something else we use a lot in our cooking is fresh lemon and balsamic vinegar, red wine vinegar, just yeah. to, you know, really give a flavor burst. And it's fun when you start getting the hang of it all. Mm -hmm. it makes absolutely. for delicious meals. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, we had a uh, message sent into us with a question. Um, so for gastrointestinal symptoms of diarrhea or constipation, what are the best foods to eat if you're having those GI symptoms? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times if you're, if you're having both, because that happens sometimes, you're starting out with um, one symptom and you may have constipation and then diarrhea or vice versa. So the soluble fiber foods are really helpful in that case. So those would be bananas, potatoes, rice. Having and right in this case, we would recommend white rice because that would be um, something that would help give you uh, binding properties. So having those and usually a lower fiber diet at that point um, that'll help kind of um, give you more regularity and give you the the soluble fiber will help with that. So yeah. Yeah, there's a, we have a list of foods that trigger diarrhea and then foods that bulk. Um, but something like you hear that yogurt's good because it's putting back that good intestinal flora. But we do want you to avoid yogurts that have live culture like Activia because that can actually aggravate the diarrhea. And, you know, you can speak with your physician or your APN. A lot of times they will recommend like over-the-counter Imodium for diarrhea, following the package directions. Start with that, and then if you need something stronger. But um, if you're having a lot of diarrhea, I would let your physician know because it could be something else involved. And we're available too at the cancer center. If you have questions, you can call us there. We also have a dietitian here at Living Well that can answer questions for those that are not coming to the Del Mar Cancer Center or the Warrenville Cancer Center. So we're here as a resource as well. And also hydration is so important. If you're experiencing these GI symptoms, um, and normally a person going through treatment, we recommend six to eight glasses or eight ounce glasses of liquid. And that's true for really anybody. In this kind of cold and stuff, we need to stay hydrated. Um, but a person who's experiencing diarrhea really needs to make up their fluids. Otherwise, they end up coming in for IV fluids. But yeah, it's nothing to mess with. Yeah. 
Oh, and that leads us into the next question. Um, Susan asked, I get tired of water. What are some other options for staying hydrated? Yeah. I mean, it depends on your taste. Like myself, I like having some sparkling water, or sometimes I might put a little little bit of juice to flavor it, um, or I might squeeze a lime in there. But um, a lot of our patients find that water just serves the purpose for them. I do like the, um, you can do cucumber and basil too. It's very spa. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of nice to put um, maybe a pitcher of water with some chopped up strawberries and put that in the fridge and just kind of leave it. It helps you kind of monitor how much you're having as well. So I think um, those are a good one. But you can also get fluids from things that melt, uh, like occasional ice cream, um, but also um, soups. And then even like canned peaches, canned pears, in the summer, watermelon. So fruits that have a lot of hydration to them will also help. So there are a lot of ways that you can do it. But um, those are a few. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, if you, you have to be careful, too. If you're going through treatment and you're experiencing some mouth soreness, you know, a lemon in water is really flavorful. But if you have mouth soreness, you have to be really careful about citrusy fruits and things so it could aggravate it. So just it's kind of that if then what's going on at the time. So. And, you know, with that mention of mouth sores, um, is there anything that a person can do to prevent or manage them, things that might help with them? Yeah, well, I'll just grab this real quick. Um, <laughs> we promote this a lot at the Cancer Center for managing taste changes and even mouth soreness. But you would take a quart of water and you put a teaspoon of baking soda and a teaspoon of salt and stir this up. And you can keep it in your bathroom with a little cup. And if you swish your mouth before and after you eat, it can help cleanse the palate and keep kind of a fresh environment. Um, but also using a soft toothbrush so that you're being gentle and not being real vigorous with brushing so you don't scrape your mouth. And even hot food like a pizza or something really hot, let it cool a bit so you don't unnecessarily get a blister in it. Um, but this is a great little helpful tip because it's things you have in your house already. And we don't want you um, using mouthwash with um, alcohol in it because that can burn. Um, well, and a lot of times um, your doctor or your, your nurse may be able to suggest another kind of mouthwash that would be helpful. There's a biotine or a magic mouthwash. Um, so check with them as well. A lot of times we have found the baking soda salt mouthwash to be really helpful. Yeah. So even with those options, try this too because we can really see a difference in a lot of our patients. Yeah, I remember talking to a patient recently who had finished treatment, and I said, so tell me, what were the helpful things that got you through treatment? He said, well, eating small, frequent meals and snacks so that you avoid that overfull feeling, using the mouth, the water, salt water, um, and staying hydrated were really things that helped him. And, and you'll hear the advice, but if you actually implement it, you may then experience the positive side of it and yeah. get you through. Yeah, so. I agree with all those tips. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we had a, received a question earlier from Elizabeth. Um, she said that my spouse will not eat and it is causing discord between us. I just want what is best for him. What do you suggest? That can be a really difficult situation. And I think it's one thing that we as caregivers can control. So we want to suggest having having food and eating, and but a lot of times they can only eat a certain amount. So yeah. what's best is to kind of communicate with them about what, what works for them. We found a couple of things really helpful. One, try a lot of different foods, maybe not your favorite food that, um, you know, you, your favorite foods might not taste as good, so try those. Um, again, like Nancy said, trying those small, frequent meals, that's helpful too, just having um, small things throughout the day. And then three, making sure you're getting protein. Um, that'll help with maintaining weight. So sometimes that's difficult when you don't feel like eating. So having five to six small meals where you have protein at each time is really helpful. And I think with the caregiver, 
And I think we too, we love to cook and we have families and a lot of people show their love through food and cooking and all. And it is so hard when they see their spouse not being able to eat or they just invested all this time in making a, one of their favorite dishes and then the patient can only eat one or two bites and then it becomes this frustration. Um, but sometimes what patients will do is they might just wait till the day of and then if the patient says, I would like such and such, they just go out and pick something up. Something like even like a, even if it's fast food, just to get food and calories in. And that way they're not spending all this time in the kitchen just to do a little enticing. And it is, it can be so hard for patients though, or the caregiver when they get that. We just don't want it to become a negative because they can't help it, the patient. They're doing the best. Well, and I like how you said pick up something because that way you don't have all of the smells of right. the food. And that can be really annoying for someone who's just not mm -hmm. feeling well. So if you yeah. pick up something, you bring it home, and they may not like it right now, but they may be able to have a couple of bites in a couple of hours. So, yeah. you know, um, just keep trying different things is, is yeah. really the helpful. And the other thing, too, um, people will get, they might resort to, like, Ensure or high-protein, high-calorie beverages, and maybe someone might not like the taste, but they'll play around with it. I, we had one patient who put peanut butter and a little bit of coffee and just kind of made their own drink, and it got them to take it, and they and even ice cream, and they, got, they made themselves a high-calorie beverage, and that was great. It was a great idea because um, at least they could eat something that way that didn't require a lot of effort and yeah, awesome. absolutely. Yeah. So you you touched on protein, of course. Um, how much protein should a person be aiming to have per day? And then uh, are there protein supplements that they should consider? Yeah, we the protein amount is very individual. So yeah. we figure that out um, based on calculations, and it's. Um, for an example, a 150 pound person would need 70 to 80 grams of protein a day. So an egg will have six or seven grams. Um, a uh, three ounce serving of chicken would have 24 to 28. So you kind of need to think about your meals and that's why we like the small frequent meals so you can <laughs> fit that protein in throughout the day. But it's very individual, so we usually help our patients figure out exactly how much they need. And it's very individual, like Mary said, because when a patient comes in and we first see them, if they've already been struggling with eating and they've been losing weight, they're going to have higher protein needs, where if someone who comes in who's doing great, and, you know, then they would need a little bit less. So we, it's all individual, but um, with every meal, and every snack, we tell patients to try to get a protein source, because anybody going through treatment does tend to have an increased need for protein. There it's are important. a lot of good protein shakes out there. Um, we recommend uh, the certain one that would work for that patient. So there's Insure, Boost, Premier, and they have um, a new formulation of a Boost Max or an Insure Max. Those are higher protein, lower carb, if that's what would work for you. Um, there are some that are very high calorie for people that need those. And there are all different kinds of um, protein supplements. So I do like the idea of uh, the variety. So the Unjury soup is another one that we've had some really good luck with. It's more of a savory protein supplement um, that can be ordered through Unjury.com. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we just like to have all of those tools available if needed. And we also, we don't want people to think that they have to start drinking Ensure right away when they come through, you know, the cancer center. We kind of keep those in our back pocket. So enjoy food first. And then if you find that you're struggling with your appetite, then you can resort to those because we don't want you to maybe get sick of them too soon. So... Yeah, but we, the dietitian at the cancer centers regularly see patients and we're always available to you, you know, for questions um, as well. So, right, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, we have six minutes left. Oh. So, everyone that's uh, joining us this evening, if you have a certain question, feel free to leave it in the comments and we will ask it. Um, but we, again, did receive some questions earlier and George asked, can I eat out during cancer treatment mm -hmm. and are there any foods that I should avoid? 
Okay, well, um, we, you know, right now we've got a couple things going on. With COVID and a person's considered immune compromised, you'd want to be very careful about eating out or being in public places. So I would almost do curbside first. And a lot of times we do suggest not having raw fruits and vegetables when you eat out. And that's because unless you know the restaurant really well and their practices, we're just not sure that they're washing the fruits and vegetables really well. Um, so we would say if you're doing curbside, you pick something up at home if you want to then put lettuce and tomato on that sandwich you ordered or make a salad at home because you know you washed everything so well. Um, but you know, everyone's situation is a little different. If you live alone and you're not really, don't really cook too much and that's what you have to rely on, then that's what you have to rely on. And just making, try to get as healthy a choice as you can. Um, um, and being really careful. Um, usually two days, we would say, for leftovers. So throwing yeah. them away as opposed to saying, hmm, this is probably okay. During this time, we yeah. really want to be very careful. And if it's in your fridge longer than two days, you can even put a little post-it note on it or something, say, this came in here Monday. Um, because that way it'll remind you just to toss it. We don't need to take any... any um, uh, Risk. Yeah, yeah. Don't take any, any risk things. Yeah. And also with all these beautiful fresh fruits and vegetables, you got to remember they're coming in on a truck and people might be uh, exploring the produce section. They might drop something and put it back on, you know, so there's a lot of the variables there. So when you bring it home before you use it, you always want to wash right before you use it, just wash that fruit or vegetable. And if it has kind of a textury surface, you can even use a vegetable brush, cause a little friction to make sure it's nice and clean. Um, and then even the pre-washed salads, we want you to wash them again because you just don't know how often they were changing the water when they washed it. Um, and another point, too, is people sometimes might opt for pre-cut vegetables like carrots and celery or butternut squash. If that cutting is done on site, we don't want you using that product. But some stores, I know like a Trader Joe's, they have pre-cut coming in packaged up. The thing to keep, in, to keep in mind is those don't last so long because they've been exposed to the air during the process and they've become oxidized. So you want to use them up pretty quick. I myself enjoy the cutting you know, it, you um, just always want to keep your eyes down and be safe. Um, but, you know, that is part of why people do enjoy cooking. You kind of get lost in the recipe, um, and it can be fun. But some vegetables, like a big butternut squash, could be a little bit more difficult. So just always keep your eyes down when you're cutting. <laughs> so <laughs> Well, and sometimes you can um, poke them with holes and, and yeah. bake them for a little bit, and then yeah. they're easier. Like one of these guys. Uh, yeah. Acorn squat. I might drop it. So, <laughs> yeah, they're heavy. <laughs> so. Well, Nancy, you can come cut my vegetables. Oh, okay. I'm going to get to one more question here. Um, my magnesium is low. What foods are good sources of magnesium? Yeah, mm -hmm. there are quite a few that are, are helpful. Sometimes it's hard with magnesium. If you have low blood magnesium, it's hard with food alone. So you might want to just, um, I'm sure you'll be talking with your doctor about whether or not you have to have supplemental magnesium. But um, almonds are a good snack for that. Uh, people always like it when I tell them chocolate. And <laughs> a little bit of <laughs> magnesium. Avocados, yeah, yeah. Avocados. Melons. Melons are are chock full of magnesium and potassium. So so those are good. Um, and just making sure you wash the outside so that yeah. when you cut through, you don't have any germs going into the melon. But we also don't want you to think, oh, maybe I should be taking magnesium. Your medical oncologist will regularly do blood work. And based on the blood work, that person will then recommend, like maybe your B12's low, they might then suggest. So we don't want you randomly just you don't think, oh, maybe this might be good. Really, while you're going through treatment, we don't want you really taking multiple vitamins um, or anything extra, like vitamin D, calcium are okay, or if your physician prescribes something based on your blood work. and Because it can decrease the effectiveness of the treatment. Um, so Especially vitamins A, C, and E. Those yeah. are the ones that we 
that may interfere. So we wouldn't recommend the vitamin C packets. And especially if you're vitamin. talking to friends and family, they might have these well wishes like, oh, I heard this. Eh. You always should get it checked out first. People mean well, but it's not always reliable advice based on your situation. And check with your dietitian. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 Great. Well, we are through all of our questions. Yeah. This was a great discussion. Thank you so much, Nancy and yeah. Mary. Um, and then we will see you next time for our next Good. Q&A. Thanks for all who tuned in. All right. Have a great, healthy, and safe evening. Thank, Thank you. you. And so please much. join our classes, too. We'd love to have you participate, the Absolutely. Living Well Nutrition classes. Have a great night and stay warm. Yeah. Thank you.